out there, huh? Thanks for coming out. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those of you joining us online. And welcome to Emerson Unitarian Universalist Congregation. And I am Reverend Deborah Bennett. And I am Emerson's ministerial intern, Sarah Drew. A special welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. Yes, a special welcome indeed. As Unitarian Universalists, we strive to be a radically inclusive congregation, and we honor the inherent worth and dignity of each and every one of you. You are welcome here in all of your identities, and we truly hope that you are nourished in heart and spirit by our worship here today. We invite everyone joining us today to take time to get to know each other. The words spoken from us and the song sung are only part of what makes a worship service. It takes all of us, our presence with one another to truly make it worship. That is so true, Sarah. So let's begin with lighting our chalice. Each Sunday we light a candle of acknowledgement and remembrance for the Cherokee and Muscogee nations of people who lived on this land before us. May this candle humbly remind us of our interconnection and the impact of our collective actions. May there be a healing in all nations of people. And also each Sunday we light our chalice. It is a symbol of the Unitarian Universalism and a reminder of our commitment to be a beacon of love and hope to all who enter, whether that be in person or virtually. Today's chalice lighting words come from Mary Oliver. We shake with joy, we shake with grief. What a time they have these two, housed as they are in the same body. May this light hold both our joy and our grief this morning. Now, in the spirit of the beloved community and connection, let's greet and welcome each other to worship as we all share our congregational affirmation. We need, we need not, not think, think alike, alike to, to love alike. alike. Please feel free to stand and greet those around you. And those of you online, please feel free to type in the chat. keep our bodies involved in the action here. I feel like this is one of those slow mornings. So we're going to we're going to bring some energy into the room now as we rise in body or spirit. Please feel free to rise in body and our spirit and join our wonderful hymn singers. Hymn singers, thank you for coming out this morning. Let's give them a nice little hand. We're going to join together first with hymn 347, Gather the Spirit. So let us all gather our spirits and raise our voices. Oh 
few hymn singers. And thank you all. I feel we've got a little bit more energy going in the room. Ah, yes, some mornings. Well, and today's a special morning because today we honor memory. We honor those who have gone before us but who are still held firmly in our hearts and in our minds. Now, later in the service, you will each have an opportunity to light a candle on our beautiful altar to honor loved ones that have passed but whom you hold in memory. Honoring those that have died has been part of many traditions and many religions across time. And I invited our own Paulina Revere to speak to us today about the Mexican tradition of Dia de los Muertos. Did I do okay? The Day of the Dead. So, Paulina, please come. Paulina helped create, actually did create, this beautiful altar. So thank you, Paulina. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Paulina Rivera, and I would like to share to you today a little bit about Dia de los Muertos, which is a special holiday in Mexico, where I'm from. And just to make it clear, Dia de los Muertos is not Mexican Halloween. Um, so it just coincides with the day. So Dia de los Muertos is a holiday celebrated in central and southern Mexico during the chilly days of November 1st and 2nd. Even though this coincides with a Catholic holiday called All Souls and All Saints, the indigenous people have combined this with their own ancient beliefs of honoring their deceased loved ones. The belief is that the gates of heaven are open at midnight on October 31st, and the spirits of all deceased children, the little angels, are allowed to reunite with their families for 24 hours. On November 2nd, the spirits of adults come down to enjoy the festivities that are prepared for them. In most villages, beautiful altars called ofrendas are made in each home. They are decorated with candles, buckets of flowers, which are wild marigolds called sampasuchil, mounds of fruit, peanuts, plates of turkey mole, stacks of tortillas, and big day of the dead bread called pan de muerto. The altar needs to have lots of food, bottles of soda, hot cocoa, and water for the weary spirits. Toys and candies are left for the little angels, and on November 2nd, cigarettes and shots of mezcal are offered to the adult spirits. Little folk art, skeletons, and sugar skulls purchased at open air markets provide the final touches. On the afternoon of November 2nd, the festivities are taken to the cemetery. People clean tombs, play cards, listen to the village band, and reminisce about their loved ones. Thank you for allowing us to share this beautiful tradition and for everyone who brought a picture of their loved one. May we continue to celebrate this tradition. May we continue to keep this tradition alive, and may we always remember those who have passed on to another existence and what they meant to us. Thank you. Yes. So Olivia is going to come up, Olivia and Stella, and they're going to sprinkle salt around our altar or around the path that leads up to our altar. And the salt is just a way for the uh, spirits to be purified as they come to visit their loved ones. And they will also sprinkle some flowers because the smell of the flowers is what r brings the spirits to come back to visit the altar that their family has made for them. a beautiful Deo de las Muertes altar. I have a story for all ages. Please, come join me. Let's go over here. Hi guys, come on in. Well, I rarely tell a story of all, for all ages about myself. Today's story is an adaptation of a, one of my favorite storybooks from 1971, and it was written by Judith Fjorst. So, when I was a little red-haired, freckled girl, there were very few things I loved more than cats. Do any of you have kitties at home? Oh, wonderful. 
Oh, I loved my cats. Furry, snuggly, they were just wonderful. So I had a lot of cats over the years. And I, there was Charlie, there was Tabby, there was Tiger, many others. Oh, Little Dummy, can't forget Little Dummy. I bet you know a little bit about her, now that I've said her name. But my very favorite was an Angora, a little tiny female Angora named La Pou. Now, she was gorgeous. That long fur, she was sweet, she had a huge, beautiful tail. And the thing about La Pou was that she was so unique and exotic looking that I was absolutely sure she was from France. So that's why I gave her a French name, of course. So La Pou, like all the other cats, died. That reminds me a little bit of Day of the Dead. <sighs> when she died, it was really sad, like sadder than sad. I was just crushed, absolutely crushed. I cried and I cried and I cried. <laughs> I was so sad. How sad was I? I was so sad that <sighs> I didn't eat my chicken for dinner. I didn't even eat chocolate pudding my mom that had the squirt can spray of topping on the top. I didn't want to watch TV, which for at the time was a big deal. My folks knew I was really upset because it was lost in space night. You know, it was sad. So I went to bed early, another red alert moment for my family. Went to bed early and I just went and laid on my bed and cried and cried. My mom tiptoed in. She gave me a big hug. and She said, you know, why don't we have a funeral? Let's have a little service and we'll bury Lapu in the backyard. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. She said, so what you'll need to do, Bethy, is you will need to think of 10, count them, 10 good things about Lapu that you can say at the service. I thought that, okay, I can do that. So I'm thinking and I'm laying there and I'm sniffling and I think of nine good things about Lapu. And then I fell asleep without getting the tenth. So in the morning, when I got up, um, my mom wrapped Lapu in a big yellow scarf. She handed Lapu to my papa, who had dug a hole in the backyard. And my papa took Lapu and gently laid her in the bottom of the hole. And that was really sad. So then I told everybody, what everybody, my mom, my dad, and my brother at the time, um, I told them what was so special about Lapu. And there's a long list, there's nine of them. Lapu was brave and funny and clean and friendly and oh gosh, she was beautiful. Only once did she eat a bird, only once. It was so sweet when she'd snuggle up to me and purr in my ear and she would also lay flat on my belly to keep me warm. And she was very, very furry. And that was the end of my story. Except that my mom said, now, Bethy, that's only nine good things about Lapu. What's the tenth one? I said, I don't know. I fell asleep. So I told her I'd think all day, and I'll find the tenth one. So at that point, my mom had made, I don't know if anybody knows about this stuff, but it is delicious. She made a big, huge plastic pitcher of red Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid, anybody? And it had a lot of ice in it. And then she opened, opened store-bought cookies out of, a, out of a tin. They're called butter cookies. And that's when I knew this was really serious because she never gets the store-bought cookies. Mm -hmm. So my brother and I sat, John, sat at the kitchen table. And, and I said, oh, John, I'm so sad about Lapu dying. And little John says, you know, what Grandma Adel would say. I said, no. Oh, Grandma Adele would say that she is in heaven with the other dead cats and also the angels. And I said, John, she's in the backyard. We just buried her. Nope, I think she's in heaven. Grandma Adele will tell you she's in heaven. No, I don't think so, John. She's in the backyard. She's underground. She's got dirt on her now. Nope, 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 you're wrong. She's in heaven. 
No, she's not, I yelled at him. No, she's not in heaven. She's in the backyard, John. Go dig her up. Per at that point, my dad was in from the garden, and he grabbed some cookies because he was going to run back out to the yard, and he, he says, why are you guys bickering? And I said, Daddy, make John take it back. Lapu's not in heaven. She's in the backyard. My dad thought about it for just a split second, and he ends up saying, you know, kids, um, heaven's an interesting place. Anybody who's ever been there doesn't, isn't able to tell us about it. So we just imagine it. But, so it may be there, it may not be there, but that's all I know about heaven. I stuck my big old tongue out at John, <laughs> and he ran away to play with his G.I. Joes. I followed my dad back out to the garden, and uh, Daddy had a box of just these crinkled up, just they looked like dried leaves around kind of a nut or something. I didn't know what they were. And as he took the plastic wrapping off this box, he showed me what was in the box. And he looked, I looked and he says, Bethy, have you ever seen a bulb before? No, Pops. Never seen a bulb. He says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to plant these bulbs in the ground, and they're going to change. They're going to put down some roots, and by next spring, there'll be leaves and stems and flowers that come out, big yellow flowers. And it's pretty amazing. You know, Bethy, everything changes when it goes into the ground. Everything. Hmm. Do you suppose, Papa, that that means that Lapu's going to change? Nodded. He said, yep. He's from Texas, so he said yep a lot. Yep. <laughs> Lapu's going to change. Pretty soon she'll be part of the ground, and then she'll be food for the, all the plants. Maybe this tree, maybe the grass, and definitely our bulbs. Hmm. My dad assured me that helping plants grow was really a pretty good job. That's a pretty nice gig for a cat, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, went in for supper, didn't eat much supper. Decided to go lay on my bed early, you know. I was getting a little sad. No lapu. My mom came in, gave me a big hug, and she says, um, you know, Bethy, did you ever think of that tenth good thing about lapu? And I said, I have, you know? Lapu is in the ground, and she's going to help our plants in the backyard grow. The peonies, the tree, the grass, the bulbs Daddy and I planted today. And you know what, Mom? That's a pretty good gig for a cat. We all laughed. Mom and I just giggled. And I started thinking about it, and soon I was fast asleep. Pretty good gig for a cat. I think so too. Pretty good gig for anybody. So that's my story today. Who would like to help me sing the song of dedication? I stand up. My name is Sandra Malik, and I serve as a member of Emerson's Pastoral Care Team. Pastoral Care Team members are available with listening ears and caring hearts to support you during challenging times. You can contact us 
at our email address, pastoralcare at emersonuu.org. At this time in our service, we pause to share personal joys, sorrows, and concerns of our Emerson community. Each Sunday, we light our vigil bowl. Its light represents the light of hope for the peaceful resolution of all conflicts on our planet, and it honors all dedicated people who work to make that vision a reality. If you are online with us this morning, please feel free to share your joy, sorrows, and concerns in the chat. When you are with us in person, you're invited to write your joys, concerns, and sorrows in our book at the beginning of before service at the back of the uh, sanctuary. Today, Sarah will light our candles as I share these joys with you today. The first joy is from Ed and Kathy Cosper. Our daughter, Stephanie McGinley, is home from an extended hospital stay. Her husband and two sons are excited to have her home for Halloween. Our family appreciates all the kind thoughts, prayers, and hope from the Emerson community. And now I share these sorrows and concerns. Um, this is from Ann. My sister Betsy got a report of a PET scan and it's cancer. But what's good about it is it's completely localized. She begins chemo treatment tomorrow, so please hold her in your hearts during this difficult time. There are none on chat, so we're going to move to um, the personal joys and sorrows and concerns that are too tender to share in full. Please feel free to speak out their name or type into the chat the name of someone you are holding in your heart today. Teresa, John. Let us send our heartfelt intentions to all those names that have been spoken and to all beings everywhere by offering the Buddhist prayer of loving kindness. Please repeat these words after me. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May they be free from harm and suffering. May they be well in body, heart, and mind. And may they be at peace. Be peace. Blessed be. Thank you, Sandra. We're going to do things in a little bit different order today so that we can have our ritual towards the end of our service and our meditation time at that time. So you get the sermon now. Woohoo! <laughs> well, one of the great privileges of being a minister is the opportunity to support families in creating funerals and celebrations of life and memorials after one of their loved ones have passed. And each planning session feels incredibly sacred as just the right song is picked, that one that was just like their anthem to their life, or that poem was chosen that was their favorite, or a prayer is picked because it had always brought them comfort. But the part of planning I cherish the most is in hearing all the stories. Because as I sit with families, they tell stories. As a family shares memories accompanied both by laughter and tears, I often feel the presence 
of the departed with us. Even if I have never met the person, the memories seem to bring them to life in those moments and in those stories. Now, I know the seances of the early 20th century conducted by charlatans are mostly, if not all, scams. But yet I have often personally experienced what I would easily define as a visitation. There are times when I firmly believe I am hearing the voice or feeling a nudge from someone who has passed. And sometimes I wonder, what if in hearing themselves being remembered so powerfully in that moment, in those stories, in those joys, and in those tears, what if that draws them even closer to us? Now, maybe not close enough to raise a table or ring a bell, but maybe, just maybe close enough to have their presence felt and close enough to tell us that they don't have to just live in the past. Maybe if we listen closely, we can hear the lesson they teach us, that though we cannot find them in the same places because they are not there, even when we look, even when we try to see them there, but though they cannot be found there, their presence is alive. It's alive and I believe perhaps is evolving still. Now, religions and cultures throughout time offered many, many explanations about death, right? We have ideas of heaven and hell. We have ideas of reincarnation and rebirth, transcendence and nirvana. And we have the idea that we simply possibly return to the dust of the earth. But no matter what beliefs or experiences you bring to the conversation about death, there's something about memory that I think is universal across all traditions and across all cultures. When I am with a family, no matter what their spiritual beliefs may be, when they share memories, when they talk about their beloveds, I see for the briefest moment a respite in their pain and in their grief. Of all the spiritual practices in the world, perhaps stories is the most profound across cultures. And perhaps memory is somehow more related to heaven and hell than we think. It used to bother me incredibly to think that at the moment of death, the person who has died is held in some sort of suspended animation, right? That the collection of memories that others carried about this person had reached its peak, that no new memories would ever be made. When my own brother died three years ago, I kept thinking how strange it was that in the instant of his death, there was a finite number of memories I would have of him. And when I turned 55, a year older than he had ever been, I wondered, did I still have an older brother? Or did I somehow become his older sister? I am still struck by the fact that at 56, I cannot remember my big brother being my age because he was never this age. So it's no wonder that we think of life as finite when we look at memory making in this way. Memories, we are taught, are about the past, something that we retrieve. They are finite, and so perhaps people are finite as well. But the poet David White offers us a new framing that I want to share with you today and maybe play with a little bit. White invites us to not relegate memory to a thing of the past, but instead to retrieve it and to bring it into our now. Memory, White says, is not just a then recalled in a now. It's not just the past. The past is never just the past. Memory, he says, is a pulse passing through all of life, creating and recreating a continual now. What I think he is saying is that our memories of those that have passed are not just relics of our lives to be taken down from shelves on occasion to gaze at fondly. I think as he is suggesting instead that memories are themselves living life forms. Now, because our visual memories of a person are often frozen in time, we are taught to also freeze them in time. 
But what if, just as the living continue to evolve and change, what if those that have passed evolve as well, just like Beth's kitty? Now stay with me for a moment here, because we all accept that for years of our lives, throughout our lives, we are not the same person, right? The person you were 10 or 20 years ago is different than you are now. I remember vividly the day when my teenage daughter and I sat in a parked car in a driveway for some kind of mother and daughter argument for probably 45 minutes or an hour. She was being, at least in my mind, very stubborn and hard to reason with. And finally, exhausted from the back and forth and with sincere tears of grief in my eyes, I looked at her and I cried, who stole my little girl? Because sure, that person who identified as my daughter sat right there in front of me. But the sweet little mama's girl of my memories, she was gone. I grieved for that daughter even as the live version was right there in front of me. So, were my memories of my daughter as a cheerful five-year-old false or just incomplete? When someone dies, we tend to freeze that person in that moment. We may remember earlier versions of them, but their evolution ends in that moment. Our memories stop evolving. They stop developing. But perhaps that is as much of a disservice to them as it is to us. Yes, they're gone, gone from where we knew them to be. But what if our memories were, as David White speaks of, a pulse that continually creates? What if, in some form, they continue to evolve with us? In 2001, after the devastation of the events of 9-11 that took the lives of nearly 3,000 people, ABC News and Diana Sawyer set out on a mission, one that I think inadvertently revealed the answer to that very question. Soon after the towers fell, they began to reach out and interview those that had lost loved ones that day. And they soon discovered that among them there were 63 pregnant women. And ABC decided to follow those 63 mamas and their babies over the subsequent years and now decades. In a 2020 special that aired just this year on September 10th, they recount the gatherings of these families brought together by ABC. In the footage from the first year of the gathering, there's this amazing sight as they lined up 63 car seats, and they tried to capture a picture with all the kids in the car seats. Can you imagine doing that even with your three kids at any moment? <laughs> Babies were crying and screaming and giggling and crawling and tumbling out of their seats. Some were even sleeping. There's this great moment where they show one little girl reaching out to the car seat beside her to hold the hand of the little baby that was crying beside her. But eventually, magically, they got this photo. So you can go online and see this photo of 63 little babies all in their car seats. And over the years, they would meet up again and again and speak to the moms and the babies. In an interview from 2011, one 10-year-old little boy told Diane Sawyer that when he cannot sleep at night, he looks at a photo of his father, and then he looks in the mirror. And he goes back and forth, father, self. Father, self. It looks kind of like me, he tells Diane Sawyer. Somewhere between amazement and pride in his voice. And then he tells his interviewer that it is in looking in the eyes of his father that he sees himself most. Somehow this little boy calls forth the presence of a man that he never met into his own reflection into his own reflection that grows and changes through the years. And there's many stories like this on the special, often bringing to life, I think, David White's words about memory, about how memory pulses through our own lives, creating our nows. Perhaps most touching was the inspiration of the Muslim mother from Bangladesh, Baharin, Barahin. She had come to America with her husband only a few years prior to 9-11, and although he was a trained physicist, the only job her husband could get in New York was a banquet waiter at the Windows of the World restaurant 
in Tower One of the World Trade Center. Tower One, the North Tower, was the, was the first tower to be hit that day, and the plane struck between the 93rd and 99th floors. Barahin's husband worked on the 107th floor, and he would not make it down alive. At the one-year gathering in 2002, we see Barahin with her infant son, Farkad. Farkad had been born just two days after the fall of the towers that killed his father. In the special, we learn that Barahin, a Muslim woman new to the country, was having a hard time simply walking around New York City without being verbally taunted and assaulted. Can you imagine, after such a loss, being a new mother in a new country and feeling so unsafe? In the special, we watch as she breaks down into tears while getting her very first driver's license one that will give her some freedom from the streets. And then we get to hear Barahin's answer when another one of the mothers asks the question that they all face over and over. What do you say to your children when they ask where their dad is? For Barahin, the answer was simple. She says, I tell them to close their eyes and look inside their heart. Close their eyes and look inside their heart. So simple, but how true, right? Diane Sawyer summarizes the two-decade experience of following those children that must close their eyes and look inside their hearts to find their fathers by saying this. She says, these children showed us that you can find ways to remember someone you have never met. They are the ones who teach us you can love someone you have never met. But perhaps they have met their fathers, not the fathers that their mothers remember, but the fathers that they continually feel in their lives, pulsing through their eyes and through their hearts, helping them create their life anew again and again. Those that are gone do not have to be forgotten. They may not be the same as we remember them, we will not find them always in the same places that we last saw them. But if we allow them, I think that their pulsing energy will surely help us create new memories to cherish over and over as they are still part of our lives. So my friends, may the memories of those you love continue to be living. May they continue to be unfolding components of your present life. And may you see your loved ones in your own eyes when you look in the mirror. And may you always find them in your own hearts when you close your eyes. I'm going to invite us into a moment of silence. Feeling free to close your own eyes if you would like. Allowing yourself to be with, sit with the presence of those you love. Perhaps in your own mind's eye, recalling memories. Allowing those memories to draw them closer. This is not a seance, but I believe that in our collective remembering, and our collective willingness to open heart and invite in the presence, we may feel the pulsing of their lives continuing on. I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. Yes, I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. You used to rock me in the cradle of your you said you'd hold me till the pains of life were gone. 
You said you'd comfort me in times like these, and now I need you, and now I need you. now of lighting your own candle so um, Sarah will be here and I will be here with a lighter candle so I'm going to invite people on this side to come here and people on this side to come here and you'll light and then go back so that we don't cross over the center um, and this is a time for you to come and, and just take a moment light a candle in remembrance of someone uh, that you hold dear
some candles for those of you online. If you um, have your own candle and like to light it to join us, please feel free to do that. Otherwise, we will light some candles here for you. I'd like to ask if you could lower the lights for a moment. And invite us into a moment of prayer. To allow your eyes to close if that works for you. Or you may have your eyes open and gaze upon the altar. bringing to mind the candle that you lit and the person for whom you lit it. Spirit of life and spirit of love, there is so much we do not know. There are so many mysteries to this world we do know that we have loved and we do know that life matters and so into your arms we share memories of those loves and those lives and we open our hearts to the possibility that the energy that was the source of that love and that life can be with us even now. If you would like, please say aloud the name of your loved one, inviting their presence to be with you in your heart in this moment and to be with us. their presence to be with us, allowing their love and their wisdom to bathe you and to bathe all of us here together, allowing the memory of them to be alive with us here today. allowing the love that they were in your life to continue to evolve and touch your now and your now. As you're ready, I invite you to rise as we share in our closing hymn. Can someone tell me the number of that hymn? 1008, it is in the teal hymnal.
For sharing your love in your hearts today and your loved ones. I'm going to close with these words by poet John O'Donohue, who says, And when the work of grief is done, the wound of loss will heal, and you will have learned to wean your eyes from that gap in the air and be able to enter the hearth in your soul where your loved one has awaited your return all the time. So may you find your loved ones again and again. Blessed be. Here at Emerson, our vision is to be a radically inclusive, open-minded, beloved community that is a vibrant source of peace, hope, and healing in the world. We know we cannot live this vision alone, and so each month we partner with another organization and encourage our members and friends to support the work they do, both financially and with action. This month, we are partnering with Lost and Found Youth of Atlanta. Lost and Found Youth envisions a world where all youth feel safe and supported to live and love authentically. Their mission is to end homelessness for all LGBTQ youth by providing them with skills and support needed to live independently. In addition to making financial contributions, consider stopping by their thrift store to shop or donate items or volunteer directly with them. As our donation baskets go around, please feel free to take a card which describes the ways to give and enjoy a lollipop just for the fun of it. All donations, unless otherwise specified, are shared equally with Emerson and our partner organization. you have been nourished in heart and in mind by our worship today. As our chalice is extinguished this morning, please join me in the final words. They are posted in the chat and in the order of service. We extinguish this chalice 
but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Please join us on the back terrace for refreshments and fellowship. Those of you online, please stay tuned and you will be able to go to virtual breakout rooms for fellowship time. At 11.15, our second hour activities for adults, children, and youth begin. Please see the listing in the order of service. And now, a and wait, there's more. A I hope in your order of service you saw this wonderful little flyer that Maggie gave. It's our fellowship reboot. I think we need some fellowship time. What do you think? I think it's time. So we have scheduled, uh, the, the whole team of people have scheduled lots of wonderful things coming up in November and December, so please take a look. Uh, and I want to highlight one, well, I'll, I'll, save, I'll save the first for last because we have a special announcement about that. But what do you think, uh, Sarah? I see like Thanksgiving coming up with some turkey meal. They, Yay! Yeah, they all look amazing, but my eye is going right to the cookie exchange. Oh, on, nice, uh, nice. 19th. Yeah, I could yes. see that. I could see that. I also like the family night and taco bar coming up in November 3rd. So please grab one of these if you didn't get one, and all these uh, things will be posted. And please join us for fellowship so we can begin to build back better. Wait, where did I hear that before? <laughs> And we have a special one coming up this Saturday, so please join us as Waldo's Coffee House returns. Maggie, where's Waldo? Wait, everybody, look over there. I think, I think. Where's Waldo? Waldo? Anybody see Waldo? Waldo, where are you, Waldo? Waldo? Are you in here? Waldo? Hello? 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 Waldo? Waldo? Where are you? They told me Waldo's was here. Waldo! Waldo? 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 Thank you, Alex. Yes, Alex, come back. Waldo's is here. So Waldo's will be returning next Saturday right here, 7 p.m. in our special opening act, Bruce King. <laughs> Followed by a wonderful uh, folk duo called True Stories. Uh, so I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful time. So you can pre-register on Realm or you can just show up. I think that's it. Go now in peace. Take peace wherever you go. Blessings to everybody. Mm -hmm.